The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie. I've been a member of this church for a really long time and I have the privilege of working for the church, um, overseeing our social action which is our projects that um, look to support people locally who are facing poverty or injustice of any kind. It's a real privilege to be speaking as part of the baby Thanksgiving this morning. So if you're here as a visitor, just let me welcome you from me as well. I know you've already been welcomed, but let me say a welcome to you from me as well. I'm actually going to start by talking about something that might seem a bit weird. I'm going to talk about rules. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to get on to some other things, but I wanted to start by thinking about rules. And I'm going to start by telling you something um, pretty bad. So a few weeks ago, I was driving home late at night from a meeting over in Crawley. Um, I had been working. I'd actually had a really, really busy day working since really early in the morning. It was actually part of a really, really busy month where I had been travelling an awful lot. And I was really tired I felt quite alert while I was driving. I wasn't like falling asleep. You know when your eyes are starting to close? It wasn't like that. But I don't know if any of you have ever done this, where you drive and it's like you're on autopilot and you almost can't quite remember how you've got to where you're going. So it was that kind of driving. I was driving along um, this dual carriageway when I suddenly saw a car in the distance that looked like it was on my side of the road. And I'm driving along thinking, why are they on my side of the road? Like, what are they doing? How did they even get over here? When I suddenly realised they weren't on the wrong side of the road. I wasn't on a dual carriageway. I'd just forgotten that I was no longer on a dual carriageway. So it was me who was driving on the wrong side of the road. Now, thankfully, I had plenty of time to move back over. Although when I first told Paul Mann this story, he said they're probably still in a ditch somewhere in that. But actually, thankfully, there was a lot of space, a lot of distance between me and them. So I had plenty of time to move back into the correct lane before the car was anywhere near me. Um, In some countries, though, there aren't the same rules, are there, on the roads that we have. So I lived in China for a year. And I'd been there for weeks, uh, just not really understanding the rules of the road. I wasn't driving out there. But as a pedestrian, I would often come up to a zebra crossing and I would stand there. And I'd wait for a car to stop. And no cars would stop. And I learned that basically, when I lived there at least, this may not still be the case now, but the rule was, go for it confidently and it's your right of way. So even as a pedestrian, basically you you step out and you hope and you pray. And actually, generally speaking, cars stop if you've done that boldly. And then a few years ago, I had the privilege of going to India, to Mumbai. And to my Western eyes, where our, we have a lot of rules about driving, don't we? We have a lot of rules about sticking to the same side of the road. To me, in Mumbai, it just seemed like chaos. I could not discern if there were any rules whatsoever. Um, whether you were on a moped or driving a bus, just go for it and weave your way in and out and you'll be all right. And... So I think, for me, often we think of rules as being restrictive, don't we? Some of us do, anyway. I do sometimes. Um, Instinctively, I think I don't really like rules. I don't really like being told what to do. I would rather just do whatever I want. Um, I know some people love rules, but I think, generally speaking, certainly in British culture, I think we're a little bit suspicious about rules. Um, I think it's one of the reasons, actually, that a lot of people aren't really interested in God or the Christian faith, because they think, well, you know, Christianity is just a bunch of rules, isn't it? And maybe you're here today and you feel like that, and maybe you're a Christian here today and you feel like that as well. It's just a bunch of rules, and maybe some of you have thought to yourself at some point, why would I want to follow a bunch of rules that were set out a few centuries ago? Um, I wonder if for those of you who are visiting here and maybe you're not a Christian, if you're here with a Christian or you're close to a Christian, they've probably said to you at some point, you know, Christianity isn't about rules. It's about a relationship with God. And that is true. But actually, it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that Christianity is both about a relationship with God and about rules, It's about a relationship with God who has set some rules for us, rules so that we can flourish and thrive and live well. There actually are quite a lot of rules in the Bible, 
But Christianity is about getting to know the God who made us and who loves us. And as we get to know him, we see that he is good, that he is kind, that he is just, that he is perfect and that he is fair. He's, he's all these things. He's holy. And so we can trust his rules because actually he is good. And often that's the case, isn't it? We trust rules if we know that the people who set them are good and have our best interests at heart. So there will be some among us who are real rule keepers who like the fact that in the Bible there are quite a lot of rules because we like things to be black and white and we like to know exactly what we need to do and how we need to live. And there will be others among us who just really react against that. Something within us instinctively is a bit rebellious and doesn't want to follow any rules set by other people. And if I'm honest with you, I'm a bit of both. I find there are times when I love rules and I like knowing exactly where I stand. And then there are other times where I just think, I don't don't want to do that. And who do you think you are to tell me what to do? And I think that about various people in my life at various points in time. And we can think that as a society, can't we? But I think whether you're a rule keeper or a rule breaker, we can all agree there are some rules that are good. I think we would all agree that having a rule that says drive on the same side of the road as everyone else probably is a good rule to have. And then some more, um, I guess, rules like do not murder. I think that's one that we would all agree on is a a pretty good rule. And I think if we start to think about it, we'd see there are loads of rules that we actually appreciate and value and think are good. I think where we start to get a bit stuck is when we really can't make sense of a rule. So, for example, did you know that since 1872... It has been illegal in the UK to be drunk in a pub. Isn't that, that is actually illegal today, to be drunk in a pub. Seems of all the places that that would be illegal, that doesn't quite make sense to me. It is also illegal currently in the UK today to handle salmon in suspicious circumstances. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but it is illegal. It is also illegal to shake a carpet in the street, but you can shake a doormat in the street, but only if you do it before 8 a.m. in the morning. (laughs) There are rules that make sense to us, and there are rules that don't, and the Bible's like that. It contains a lot of rules, and some we really understand, like do not murder, and some that might be harder for us to make sense of. But if God made us, if that is true that God made us, then we can trust that he knows better than we do. Because actually, often, don't we, we trust that the, the, the one who sets the rules, if they, if they know us, if they know best, then actually it means their rules are going to be better than our rules, actually. We can trust that his rules are good because he is good. His rules are best for us because he knows the world and he knows people and what we're like better than we do. God made us and he cares for us and he wants to do us good and he's set out rules that are actually safeguards for us. They're about protection and provision for us. And that's us as individuals, us as communities, and for society as a whole. And actually, in setting out rules in the Bible, when we actually look into it and we dig deep into the rules, we see that so many of them show God's special concern for those who have fallen on hard times, no matter how they got into their difficulties, for whatever reason. God seems especially concerned to set rules for the vulnerable that are about provision and protection. Let me give you some examples. Uh, One is that God says that for his people, for his community to flourish, those selling food shouldn't make a profit on it. Just think about that at the moment. We are now as a nation in a cost of living crisis. Notice God isn't saying don't make a living from selling food. He's saying don't make a profit from selling food. I looked some of this up this week and milk has gone up 20% in the last year according to the Office for National Statistics and it could, it's expected that it'll increase by up to 50% in the coming months. Uh, pasta's gone up more than 10%. Uh, most meats like beef, chicken, pork have um, gone up and so are things like cheese, eggs, tomatoes, all of these have had a significant increase. I'm sure if you've done a shop recently you'll have noticed this, won't you? If you've been to a supermarket recently you're going to have noticed how much your weekly or fortnightly or however often you shop, how much that has gone up by. I've certainly noticed that myself. 
Now, some of the reason food prices have gone up is because the cost of producing food has gone up. So farmers, it's costing them more to produce food, therefore they're having no choice but to put up the cost of food. But actually, the reality is that there are lots of people in our nation who make a profit on food. So one of the leading supermarkets in the UK is about to report profits of two and a half billion pounds for the last financial year. So I can't even, cons can you imagine that? Two and a half billion pounds, it's just a, such an abstract amount of money, isn't it? It doesn't really kind of compute with me. But like I say, God didn't say in his rules, don't make a living from food. What he says is don't make a profit from selling food. And why does God say that? Well, because food is essential. <laughs> We all need food, don't we? And actually, those who suffer the most when food is expensive are the poorest, are those who have the least. And so God's saying, don't push people into poverty. Don't exclude people from being able to get food. Don't make a profit on food because it's something that should be accessible to everyone, no matter how much money they've got. Some other rules uh, that God set so that people should be paid their wages on time. That people, when they've done work, they should get their wages on time. I know someone who works for a company where they deliberately wait as long as possible to pay invoices that they owe. It's not right. It's not how God wants people to do it. God wants people to be paid on time. God also says that people from other nations should be cared for when they come to your land, should be treated as if they lived here all along. God says that those who have more food or clothing or shelter than they need should share open-handedly with those who don't have enough. There are a lot of rules in the Bible, and I think some of these, when I look at them, I think they're just wonderful because they're about providing for people who are struggling. And whether or not you like rules, I think most of us would agree that to protect and provide for the most vulnerable is not only necessary, but it's good and it's right and it's just and it's fair. One thing I find especially fascinating in the Bible, um, and a passage is going to come up on the screen behind me from Deuteronomy, a part of the Old Testament in the Bible, Deuteronomy 15. God says, if we follow his rules, there need not be any poverty among us. Let me read this to you. It's going to come up on the screen. Uh, Deuteronomy 15. However, there need be no poor among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I'm giving you today. Basically, God is saying, if we follow the rules that he's given us, then there won't be anyone in poverty among us. But as we all know, we, we don't follow rules, do we? Um, Maybe you guys do. I don't. I, I don't follow rules. We haven't followed the rules that God set out. And actually, sadly, there is poverty all around us, and it is increasing around us at the moment as well. But it's not what God planned. It's not how he wants it to be. It's not the way he wants us to live. But he's given us the freedom to listen to him or not listen to him. We have a choice. We can say, actually, I trust you, God, that you're good and that you, as you're the creator, you know the rules that are best and we can follow them. Or we can say, actually, I think I know better. I think I'd rather live by my own rules. And so often that's what we do. We see actually in the Bible that time and time again, even those who worship God, even those who do follow God, start to wander away from his rules Sometimes in big, rebellious, catastrophic ways, and other times just in really subtle, drifting ways. But what happens is that as we wander away from his rules, we start to wander away actually for compassion, from compassion for other people. We start to disregard justice for other people. We start to become increasingly self-centered and individualistic. And the best outcome of that is that we just stop caring about other people, but the worst outcome is that we actually even start to oppress other people. And we start to be okay as long as I'm all right. Sorry, this all sounds a little bit depressing, but there's good news to come. 
because actually we fast forward several hundred years from that passage that I just read out in the Bible and we come to the life of Jesus who we've been singing about and worshipping this morning. And Jesus spent most of his life on earth with people who are vulnerable, with people that no one else liked, with people that others shunned and despised and rejected. Jesus came and he healed people and he fed people and he ate with those that others wouldn't go anywhere near. He forgave people. He gave dignity to people. He gave compassion to people. He got angry at injustice. Jesus came and lived a perfect life. Jesus is actually the only person who's ever lived who's kept all the rules. He lived a perfect life. He showed mercy, compassion, kindness, and justice. Like I said, he got angry at injustice and things that weren't right and the mistreatment of others. He stood up for the oppressed. And Jesus actually said of himself that he was anointed by the Spirit of God to bring good news to the poor, to bring good news to those in poverty. And so Jesus taught his disciples, he taught the people around him to have compassion on those around them. He taught the people around him that basically they were to live in a way that would reach out to others rather than push others away. That their lives could make a difference to those around them rather than just living for themselves. That they could actually live for the glory of God and part of living for the glory of God is that you do good to others around you at the same time. After Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, the same spirit that had anointed him to bring good news to the poor then anointed his followers to do exactly the same. Let me read a couple of passages from the book of Acts. This is the first Christians after Jesus has died and risen from the dead. And this shows us what it looked like for the first Christians to be anointed with the Spirit of God to bring good news to the poor. So in Acts chapter 2, it says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many did wonders and signs, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Let me read that bit again. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And then in Acts chapter 4, it says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need." So what we see here is that actually when the followers of God, when the followers of Jesus are anointed with the Spirit of God that brings good news to the poor, what we see is there's not a single person in need among them. Now that they're following the ways of Jesus, now that they're following the rules that God has set for them, they're trying to live the way Jesus lived, they're trying to follow the rules that he followed, what we see is that one of the ways this impacts everyone around them is that there isn't a single person in need. There's not a single person in poverty. There's not a single person lacking their food or clothing or shelter that they need for that day to get through. And what makes this particularly incredible is that historians would tell us that in any Greek or Roman town or city at that time in history, 50% of people would be in poverty or living on the edge of it. So imagine that. Imagine that if in society as a whole, in every community around you that you can see, half of the people are in poverty. Half of the people don't have what they need to get by. Half of the people are struggling to provide for their families. And then suddenly there's this, there's this group of people 
the church, where not a single person is in need. Imagine the contrast. Imagine how stark that would have been to see so much poverty here and then not a single bit of it right here. And it wasn't because everyone in the church was rich. It wasn't because everyone in the church was wealthy and had money. It was because they shared. It was because they shared what they had. They didn't consider their belongings to be their own. It's radical generosity and it's radical community as well. Imagine what it would have looked like to the world around them. And for those of us here today who follow Jesus, this is how we're supposed to live too. There should not be a single person in poverty among us, not because we're all rich, but because we all consider that actually what is mine is yours. What's mine is yours. It's radical countercultural living that doesn't say what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, but actually what's mine is yours. Now, the vast majority of us, including myself, don't live like this. You could just ask any of my colleagues here at the church how I feel about people borrowing my phone charger to see that I do not think that what's mine is theirs. Um, On a regular basis, people seem to just come and help themselves to my phone charger and they don't return it. And I get very agitated, to put it mildly, about this. I definitely have an attitude towards my phone charger. That's mine. You can't just take that. And I think the truth is that most of us have things we don't want to share, don't we? Most of us do. I had a friend who was particularly attached to a jumper that she had, and I really wanted that jumper, so I kept saying to her, can I have that? She'd be like, no, it's mine. You can't have it. I never got it either, which is pretty disappointing. Maybe it'll change after this talk. (laughs) We live in a society and a culture that is very individualistic and very materialistic. What society would say as a whole is basically what is mine is mine and what's yours is yours. You can have what you've got, but what's mine, I've worked hard for it, so it's mine. But the rule that God sets for his people is totally countercultural to that. The rule that God sets for his people is basically saying, share. Share what you've got. That what you've got isn't just for you. If God has blessed you, then what you've got is for you to share with other people who've got less than you've got. We're called to live in a way which basically says, if I've got something you need, let me either give it to you or share it with you. And if I've got more than I need, let me give away to bless you. Part of the reason we do baby thanksgiving the way we do it is because we adopt this principle where I don't say to you, do you know what, they're your kids, they're your responsibility. But we believe that actually we're we're in it together, we're family together, that actually your kids aren't just your responsibility, but I should help you and support you in any way that I can. One of the things that actually should make followers of Jesus distinct that should kind of set us apart, should be that there would be no person in need among us. And the way that this happens in the Bible, certainly among the first churches, is that no one sees their belongings as their own. They live by the rule, whether it's spoken or unspoken, that any needs around me are my responsibility, not just yours. And that if I have the means to help, that I should. And so what this means, practically speaking, is that if I'm having a chat with someone and I hear that they need something, instead of going to my default response, which is to think, well, I'll pray for you, actually, often, I can just say, can I help with that? I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for people, of course not, please don't mishear me, it's great to pray, but sometimes I go to that first, I go, I'll pray for you, and actually, I could just solve the problem. I could answer the prayer before I've even prayed it. It might mean that um, I, I can offer to give something or loan something or buy something if I'm in a position to do that. It might mean for those of us who are in a position to offer other people, other people training or employment that we do it that way. What it also means if, is that if you are in need, you don't need to feel any shame about talking to your friends in the church or your connect group or pastors in the church about it because the expectation in the Bible is that we will meet each other's needs. So when you're in need, you come and you receive help. And when you've got more than you need, you help others. 
That's the biblical principle. And actually, that's the principle on which food banks run. Food banks run like a bank. That's why they're called food banks. Because the idea is that when you're in need, when you need to take something out, you come and you make a withdrawal. But when you've got enough, you might come and put something in. That's, how the, that's the principle behind a food bank. You know, a few years ago, I was mostly unemployed, but I'd have a few shifts of work here and there, and I really, really needed a car but I couldn't afford one. So a group of people in the church clubbed together and bought me a car. And it was incredible. It was such an incredible blessing. It was an old banger and it was held together by duct tape. Genuinely it was, but it was such a blessing to me because they bought me a car when I needed one and I couldn't afford one. Now that's a big thing, but it could be a much smaller thing than that. For all of us, whatever our situations, there are ways in which we can apply this. I mean, for me, it might be that I need to start seeing my phone charger as not just mine. I might just stop bringing it to work. No, I won't. I won't. But, you know, maybe you think, well, actually, do you know what? I haven't really got anything. Maybe you've got time. Maybe you've got time, and maybe you can call someone who's isolated and lonely, and you could see your time as not just yours, but for the good of others, too. Perhaps you've... um, got some things you can share. Maybe you've got tools, DIY tools, and someone you come across someone and they haven't and they need some. Maybe you've got some skills with DIY that you could loan to someone in the church. I often joke that basically my first port of call is Nick Beanie. If something goes wrong, so I phoned him recently and said, my tap's not working, can you help me? Um, but basically, he's like my um, on-call handyman in the church because basically I have no skills in DIY, but he does. So, and on the back of this, I'm going to have to get him to come around and fix a few things. That'll be your practical application, Nick. But, you know, maybe you can fix a leaking tap for someone or you can put up a shelf for someone. Maybe you've got a lawnmower or a slow cooker or a laptop, something that you can lend to someone. Maybe even it is something like a car that you could lend to someone else. Maybe it's your meal table. Maybe it's just not seeing your meal table as your own, but seeing your meal table as for the good of others. It could even be your home. As a nation, we've seen over 150,000 people sign up to offer their homes to Ukrainian refugees. It's amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing response. Perhaps you could offer your home to someone, maybe as a safe place to live, or maybe just as a safe place to hang out and come and be part of your family. Maybe you've got two winter coats, and as we head into a winter that we're told is going to be more and more difficult as energy bills go up again, maybe you're just going to find someone who you can give your second winter coat to. Maybe you run a business and you can offer someone a job or an apprenticeship or a training in some way. Perhaps you've got some savings you can use to fill up someone's car with petrol or pay someone's gas or electric bill for a month or two. There's any number of ways we can apply this, and many of us do it already. So if you're someone and you think, well, actually, I'm already doing this, well, then please just take this morning as an encouragement to press into it further and further and to keep going. But I know that for me, I'm very much shaped by our society And it takes intentional effort for me to think about my stuff as not just mine, but as belonging to others as well. And as the cost of living crisis gets harder, I think the prevailing attitude is much more likely to be hold on to what you've got through fear. Hold on to what you've got because you don't know if you're going to need it. And certainly for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we're called to live by a different rule to that which is to keep being generous, keep giving, keep sharing. When we do that, there need not be a single person in need among us, and then it will increasingly overflow to the communities around us as well. I wonder if the band could come back up, please. What I'd love us to do while the band come back up, it's easy to hear stuff like this and think, you know, Well, some of you might think, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, I should do something like that. But I know if you're anything like me, if I don't make a decision about what I'm going to do about something like this in the moment, then I tend not to do anything with it. I tend to go off and, you know, have my Sunday lunch and not really think about it. So I'd love us to just take a minute just to think. And this is whether you're a Christian here, whether you're not a Christian, whether you believe in God or you don't, there's stuff here that we can all apply so that we can do good to those around us and help alleviate poverty and need around us. So why don't we just take a minute to quietly think 
about how we might apply this and what we might do, even this coming week.